glad to be here with you today. My name is Olga, and I have the joy and privilege of serving our kids. Today, I will be reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing for prayer. Thank you, Ola. Let's give it up to Ola. She is a blessing to our church. She has been consistently uh, a, a blessing, serving, uh, encouraging, building up the body of Christ for the last decade, I've witnessed her do that. And so it's, it's going to be um, sad to lose her again, but let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we just ask you, would you quicken our hearts to hear this message, um, the first command, Jesus, that you ever gave um, when you started your ministry. And so, Lord, let us hear it. Let us be changed by it, we ask you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, amen means let it be so. So it's going to happen. <laughs> Welcome. My name is Alex. Um, it is a joy to have you this morning, this afternoon. It is 80 degrees today, so I will be brief. And uh, if you respond well, I'll let you go on time. <laughs> Today we're going to jump into our new sermon collection, which is Becoming Like Jesus. Last week we opened up with the intro. Today is the first sermon of 52. Uh, we're going to take about two and a half years to go through this uh, sermon series, and so I'm really, really looking forward to that. Um, last week we opened up the series with Jesus giving his disciples the great commission, the great commandment, the great commandment. And, uh, and that commandment was to his disciples who were students, apprentices, to go out and make more disciples, make more students that do all that Jesus had commanded his uh, disciples to do and uh, disciples in, in uh, the future as well. And so this today is going to be the first commandment that we are going to see Jesus give to disciples past, present, and future. Before I do that, I want to make this. Uh, I want to make this point that I didn't make last week, and this point is right after Jesus says, "Go and make disciples of all nations, um, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you." He said, "And be sure of this: I am with you always, even to the end of age." So Jesus promises His presence to all the disciples, past, present, and future. Um, specifically to those that are doing all that he has commanded them to do. If you want to experience the closeness of God, right, you want to sense God's joy and deep contentment and deep peace, um, God's approval over your life, you need to be a disciple of Jesus, living out his commands, following his heart, his will. Um, sp spirituality is not jumping around from Sunday to Sunday and from conference to conference, uh, searching for closeness. That's not how you uh, experience the closeness of God. If you want to experience the closeness of God, do what he has commanded you to do. His closeness, his presence is promised to his disciples. And so David, he says that of this, uh, of God's presence and God's closeness. He says uh, in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have asked the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. 
Lord, I just want to see you. I just want to be with you. Lord, I need you as my great rabbi that is giving me the commandments that are good for my soul. And then he says, this is the reason why I want this. This is the reason why this is the exact thing that I will spend all of my energy on. And then the results are this, verse 5. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. He says, listen, if the Lord is with me, if, if I have access to his presence to receive commandments and receive instructions, who, sh- who should I be afraid of? What situation, what circumstance is going to dictate my joy and my peace and my confidence? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Because the Lord has, prote- he has put a wall around me. He has protected my soul from uh, 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 external circumstances. And the response in uh, the worst of seasons and situations in life is not, is not uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of, of, of where you're feeling despair, but of shouts of joy for those that don't know how to sing. <laughs> we just shout. We're just making joyful noises as our response to God's closeness and God's presence. And for those that are more talented, they are making melodies and singing to the Lord. Friends, we desperately need God's proximity. We long, our deepest desire is for his proximity, his closeness. And that is offered to his disciples, people that are following Jesus as rabbi and as apprentices. And so what is the first commandment that Jesus gives? Repent. Repent. Jesus shows up on the scene, and the first words that come out of his mouth are repent. This was Jesus' first sermon, repent. Scholars believe that Jesus is picking up from where John the Baptist left off. Repent. Peter after preaching his first sermon in Acts chapter 2, and the Bible says that people's hearts are moved, and their response is, what shall we do, Peter? He looks at them and he says, repent. The apostle Paul is ministering to the Gentiles abroad, and his theology or his doctrine is summarized into this one word, repent. He says in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, how did, how did I not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and, and from house to house? Verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's going from house to house and temple to temple, and he's preaching one message, and that is the message of repent towards God. Repent towards God. And so we're sitting here today, and you have heard this sermon before. And you are overconfident that you know what this sermon or what the word repent means. But can I just interject and say that I believe that repentance is one of the most misunderstood Christian concepts, Christian words. There are three types of people in this room and three different perceptions on this word repent. And one is, I think I did it, and I I think I'm good. There was a day, I was 15 years old, and I repented. And others are here, and you are not as sure, and you think you repented, but your life is not reflecting Repentance, and so you are a little uneasy about your experience of repentance. And then the third perception here is listen, I don't want to hear it. All right, let's move on to the next sermon. Okay, repentance is not my thing. I need to hear a different, different sermon. 
you are reluctant towards repentance. You are reluctant towards even the subject. And so in my attempt to, to, uh, to explain or to really uh, help us understand Jesus' first command, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in, in, in four ways. Um, number one, who should repent? Number two, why should we repent? Three, what is repentance? And then four, how in the world do we do it? How do we repent? And so let's start out with this passage. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were some present at the very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. And so you have these two groups of people that perished under gruesome circumstances. And these people with uh, Jesus, right, they have that same idea and that same tendency that we all have. The people that need to repent are the folks that are experiencing hardship. The people that are living in chaos. We look at a country that perhaps is going uh, through famine or experiencing some kind of uh, turmoil, and we, we say they need to repent. There is no civil rest in that country. That country has lost it. They need to repent. We look at a marriage that is falling apart, and we, we make that judgment, and we say, listen, these people, they're the ones that need to repent. They're the ones that need to repent. Friends, I've even heard growing up in the conservative churches where if a child was born with some kind of physical ailment, the judgment was the parents, they sinned. There is some kind of hidden sin that they did not confess, and so they need to repent because the child is sick. Friends, Come on, we are sitting here this afternoon, and we don't sense and we don't feel the need to repent. And the people that need to repent in our eyes are the addicts. It's the addicts that need to repent. Friends, but according to Jesus' analysis, according to Jesus' judgment, he says, listen, just because they are going through hardship." Just because a tragedy is happened or happening in their life does not make you better than them. They are not worse offenders than you. You too need to repent. All of you need to repent is what Jesus is saying. All of us in this room, we need to repent. Then he gives two reasons why we need to repent. Reason number one, he says that if we do not repent, we will perish. And the word that Jesus is using is, it is this eternal, ultimate perishing that we, we will experience on the other side of eternity. But also in the present tense, if we do not repent, we will perish vertically in our relationship with God. Right? We will lose that connection with God that I just spoke about, this joy, this shouts of joy and this melody and this singing. That will cease. If we do not repent, we will lose relational connections with people. There will, there, tension will start to build up with the people closest to you. If you do not repent, you will not even be able to manage your own children. If you don't repent, you will lose internal peace and joy and confidence if you do not repent. And ultimately, if you do not repent, you will experience damnation. You will experience damnation. Now, damnation is for people that are utterly 
worthless. People that are utterly wor- worthless. And I'm going to give you, try to give you here this analogy of what it looks to be utterly worthless. Suppose you lose your car keys. And your car keys, they have a certain purpose. And that purpose is to start the cars, start the ignition. Even if it's a key, keyless a start, you need the keys in close proximity. If the cars are somewhere out in the field, there is absolutely no value to them because they are not serving their purpose. Now, this analogy has its nuances and it has its gaps because God never lost us like we lose our keys. But the emphasis here is if a key is not being used for its purpose, it it is utterly useless. There is no purpose in the key. doesn't matter what kind of emblem it has on the key. If it does not serve its purpose, which is to start the car, it has no value. And so what Jesus was saying to people, listen, if you do not repent, you will perish. What he's talking about is going to hell. Hell was this place known as Gehenna in their time. And there was this, it was this uh, dump site that was outside of the city where they would dump everything that was utterly worthless. It was these car keys that you no longer need because you already sold the car. You're not going to just collect these car keys if the car is gone. You made new sets of keys, changed the locks. You don't need these old car keys. You only needed them when they were fit for the ignition. And so you are tossed into, you will perish if you are ultimately refusing to serve your God-given purpose. And Jesus, he continues on and he says, so that There's no rebuttal against Jesus' just judgment. Jesus, how can you just toss people? Why would you do that? Give them a second chance. Do it, God. And Jesus says, I have. I have given a second chance. I just, we, people don't just perish. Listen to this. He says, and he continues on, and he gives this parable about a fig tree. And he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree. And I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, this is the vine dresser, sir, let it, uh, let it alone, leave it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on maneuver. Then if, then if it should bear fruit next year, well, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So there is this, Jesus is giving this insight. Listen, year after year, I have been coming And I have been checking to see if you are serving your purpose. And I was this close to cutting you off, this close you were to perishing. But the vine dresser intervened. And the vine dresser suggested that we create an environment, cultivate an unfavorable environment around your life. Send perhaps the right people into your life. Man, get you plugged into a church Sunday after Sunday, hearing sermon series, sermon collections. I mean, uh, whatever it need, whatever needs to happen, let's, let's try different approaches because we desperately want this tree to produce fruit. God is not in a hurry to, 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 to condemn you. Jesus was not in a hurry to condemn you. Jesus says, I did not come to to condemn, but a day will come where my words will condemn you. But what I'm here for is to, I'm here to convince you that you need to repent. You need to serve your God-given design, your God-given purpose. I desperately want that for your life. I'm giving you a second chance. Please, repent. Repent. I'm not in a hurry to throw you into Gehenna. I want to use you. Repent. And so, friends, if we do not repent, we will perish. We will perish. 
The second reason why we need to repent is because Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. The owner of the tree is here. But not only the owner, but Jesus himself is modeling what it looks like to be a fruitful tree. Jesus himself is modeling what it looks like to live according to your God-given design and purpose. And what is that purpose? That purpose is to love God genuinely and to love people genuinely, to love God increasingly and to love people increasingly. And Jesus comes and he models it. Jesus is that favorable condition. He gives us this vision. He gives us what it could look like for us to be fruitful trees, people that are serving our God-given design. And he's pleading with us, look at me, become my disciple. There is absolutely no excuse for you not to repent and produce fruit. There is absolutely no excuse. I will send my spirit to you. My spirit will cause you to do and to will. Repent. I will not expect fruit from you without investing into you, without cultivating you, without pruning you, without nurturing you. Repent. I will provide, I will make a way for you to produce fruit, but you need to repent. Jesus leaves us without any excuse. Repent, because one, we will perish, and two, I am providing a way. Repent. Jesus frustrated with the towns that he preached to and refused to repent, he gives them this truth found in Matthew 12, 41. He says, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. He says, listen, if you do not repent... The men of Nineveh will rise up on the day of judgment and they will condemn you. They will have the right judgment against you because they repented and you refused to repent. And here's what we need to know about Nineveh. It was a corrupt, corrupt city. There was exploitation, murder, rape, all of it was going on there. In, I mean, everything that you can imagine was happening in Nineveh. These people, they did not fear God. And yet God gave them a chance to repent, and he sends Jonah. And you guys all know the story from Jonah from Sunday school. The brother hated the Ninevites, wanted nothing to do with their salvation. He actually refused God's command. He, did, he, he was one of the guys that had the great omission in his life. He got on a boat, and he fled the other way. He was the older son in the prodigal story, wanting nothing to do with the younger son coming back home. And you know what? He did. He did leave the father's home, and he did go to the, to the Ninevites. And the Bible says that for three days, he preached this fancy sermon that had a lot of humor just to draw people in. He had a lot of different examples just to really uh, uh, contextualize the text. Now, he used this four-point framework for his sermon. Who needs to repent? Why do we need repent? How do we repent? What is repentance? Right? He did all of that. And that's why they repented. No, friends. Do you want to know Jonah's extensive sermon, his powerful sermon? For three days, he walked around, and he says, for 40 days, and this town, this city will be overthrown. You guys, do you hear that? 40 days, and I actually can't wait until that happens. 40 days, God says, this place will be overthrown. He's just mumbling, and people are hearing it. They're like, what, what did that crazy guy say? 40 days, and this place will be overthrown. And you know what the response of the Ninevites were, was? They repented. 
And I'll get to, in, to, to that in a moment, how they did it. But they repented with a lousy sermon. Friends, if they were able to repent, we are without excuse living on the other side of the resurrection. We have no excuse. And so then that begs the question, what is repentance? Friends, repentance is not merely being moved by a sermon to feel bad about yourself or, a certain, or the situation that you're in. It's not to be moved. It's not to feel inspired. It's not to feel uh, remorse or, or sadness of heart. It's not even to have tears come down your eyes. That's not repentance. We look at John the Baptist when he, would, when he was preaching. The Bible says that Herod enjoyed his sermons. He, he, had, he had John come and John would preach to him and Herod would be moved. Wow, that gives me goosebumps. Say it again. Mufasa, say it again, Mufasa, wow, I'm so moved, I'm so terrified. John, John, that is a very powerful sermon. And what happened with John the Baptist? Herod beheaded him. Pilate was, he was moved by Jesus and his temperament and his wisdom. He was moved by Jesus' words. And what was the final outcome with Pilate? He handed him over to be crucified. So friends, repentance is not feeling bad. It's not crying. It's not going to a, a, a conference and, and being moved by powerful singing and powerful prayers. That is not repentance. Repentance is churning around. It's turning yourself around. It's changing the direction of your life. That is repentance. John Piper, he says, repentance, repentant means experiencing a change of mind that now sees God as true and beautiful and worthy of all praise and all our obedience. That is repentance. Dallas Willard says that evil, the way you want to define evil is simply this. Evil is to miss perceive who God is. You're misperceiving who God is. That is evil. There is no other evil, worse evil than that than to misperceive who God is. And so repentance from evil is to look at God and say, God, you are beautiful. God, you are glorious. God, you are second to none. God, you are worthy of my affection. You're worthy of my obedience. I will do all that you have commanded me to do. I am repenting, God. I am repenting. That is repentance. It has nothing to do with feeling something. It's a decision you make. I will turn around from the things that are keeping me from looking towards God, from the things that are keeping me from seeing the beauty of God and the, and the things that are keeping me from obeying God. I will turn around. John the Baptist says, listen, your repentance needs to produce fruit. There has to be evidence of you turning around. It's not coming to the altar. That's not repentance. Repentance is getting in the car and turning your eyes towards God Monday through Sunday. Repentance is the doorway into the eternal life, the abundant life that God offers to his disciples. Without repentance, there is no eternal life. If you have not turned towards God, you will not live. You will surely perish. You will surely die. This is eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 17. And so how do we repent? If it's not feelings... If it's not going up to the altar, what is repentance? How do we do it? How do we do it where it produces fruit? 
I'm tired. I, I'm tired of having false repentances. I need the true one. I need the affected, effective one. How do I do this? And so I want to share with you guys a few images, and this is from our renovation of the heart uh, men's group that we're doing right now on Thursdays, and um, this has helped me tremendously to understand for myself how to repent and how to pastor people through this decision of repentance. And so um, if we can get the first slide up, I'm not a teacher uh, in the formal way, so let me do my best here to explain this to you. So God has made you, and you are a soul. That's who you are. Sing to the Lord my soul. Your soul is what integrates every element of your life, every compartment of your life, and those compartments are your social context. That's to look around. You people influence me. You influence who I am and who I am becoming. The people at work and the people at your gym and wherever your sphere of influence are, those people are contributing to the person that you are becoming or who, who have you become. The other component is your body. It's your physical element. That is your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears. Then you have your mind. Your mind represents your thoughts and your feelings. And then ultimately, just like every body, there is a heart. The hard heart that God promised to give us a new heart. That heart is your will. That is what your will is what runs your life. Your will is what dictates the direction of your life, your heart, your will. Just like the heart pumps the blood to keep all the organs alive, God has given us a will that he speaks to and that is responsible to keeping all the elements of our soul alive. And when your heart and your will is in rebellion, rebellion against God, you are no longer able to sustain your soul. You are no longer able to keep your soul alive because your, your, your will, your heart, is, it's corrupt. It's sick. And the reason why it's sick is because it turned away from God. It's no longer looking to its author and maker it's no longer receiving life from God. And because it's not receiving life from God, it is not able to pass on life to the other components of the soul. And so now your mind is struggling. Your mind's all over the place. And your feelings are all over the place. And your body is running your life. You, all, you have become an animal you are, live, uh, you are living like an animal. You're strictly instinctual. You can't control your eyes. You can't control your urges. Right? And that now is affecting your social context. Now you look at people as objects. You look at people as simply something that is of benefit to you. Something that will satisfy your selfish needs. And so now the people in your life are also suffering. Why? Because the soul, the heart, the heart itself, the will, has, is in rebellion against God. And so what part needs to repent? Is it the mind that needs to repent? The mind can't do that. Is it the body that can do that? No, the body can't do that. Is it the social context? I can't do that for you. The only way you will experience life-changing Life-changing repentance is when your heart, your heart humbles itself, your will humbles itself and turns to God and says, God, I have been a usurpant. I have been a rebellious heart. Forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Friends, I'm telling you, it always begins with the heart. 
from the heart flows everything in your life. Above all else, guard your heart because it determines the path of your life. God has entrusted your will. God has given man free will so that you can go and be fruitful and multiply. What is the fruit? To love God genuinely, love people genuinely, genuinely. Friends, but our will, the danger of free will is that it has the ability to make its own judgments. And we all have made the judgment to turn away from God. And so repentance is saying, God, I acknowledge that I have ran my soul to the ground. I have ran my, my soul is bankrupt. I am not producing fruit, which is to love you increasingly and loving people increasing. God, I, my soul is not producing that. My life is a mess. My thoughts are all over. My emotions are all over. My body is all over. I am addicted to substances, God. I am a hot mess. Lord, forgive me. I have ran my soul to the ground. Friends, that is repentance. I made a decision to pick up running about four months ago, and I, I did it because uh, Pastor Eugene inspired me. I, he kept posting all his runs to me, and I'm like, man, I could do that too, right? Come on, man. I, I'm better than that. I can do that. And so what did I, what did I do? I, I woke up one morning. Well, I, the, the morning before, I said, all right, I'm going to 530. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to go run. I made a decision. I'm going to go run. You know what happened at 5.30 in the morning? My body gave me some feedback. Hey, man, not happening. My, my legs out of nowhere became sore, right? My back just felt a little dislocated. So my thoughts, my mind jumped in and says, no, you got to go see the chiropractor today, right? Look outside. It's dark and it's cold. You don't need to run. Why do you need to run? And friends, you know what happened? I had to, my will, I, my, my heart had to make a decision. Will I allow my mind to run my life? Will I allow my body to run my life? Or will I tell them what to do? And friends, I said, get up. I got, and, and they listened to me. My body listened to me. My mind listened to me. And we went running. And it's been four months and we're still running. And I remember just even running as I'm running three miles and my mind's telling me, no, no, let's go back home. I said, no, we're going to run further. Friends, I was able to reach four mi 10 miles at a, at, at a time. In one day, running 10 miles, an hour and 45 minutes, who does that for fun? And I strictly did it to, uh, to see what my will is capable of. Friends, repentance always begins with the heart. If we look back at Nineveh, how they repented, listen to where it starts. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. He rose from his throne. He took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. That is a sign of surrender. Getting up from your royal throne, I do not own my soul. Taking off all your pride, putting on humility. And listen to this. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh by the decree, by the decree of, of the king and, and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. That's fasting. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their uh, evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Friends, how did the, the, the whole city turn around? How did that happen? It began with the king. It began with the person that calls the shots, the ultimate authority in that city. The only way we will experience true repentance is when our heart 
tells our mind and tells our body and tells our social context, we are turning to God. Like it or not, feel it or not, we are turning to God. Did you know that speaking with rehabs, did you know what, what is the common theme between people that are able to break out from uh, drug addictions and those that are not able? Do you know what it is? The gentleman told me, he says, it's the people that make, I'm done. I am done with this. And do you know how they get to that place? They have this vision, this current vision of their reality, which is ruins. They have betrayed the closest people in their life, and they are disgusted with it. And they are merely like animals, instinctual. They have lost their soul. They have lost their soul. And then they have this other vision, this positive vision of what it could look like for them to be liberated from this addiction, from this bondage. And friends, those two visions, one of perishing and one of the kingdom of God, drives them, drives them to be committed to this decision to find freedom from drug addiction. Friend, how much more for us? How much more for us? Jesus says, if we do not repent, we will perish as we are currently perishing. And if we do repent, we will live, have abundant life forevermore. We will long for his appearing. We will have joy, unspeakable joy in the worst of circumstances. Friends, we desperately need to grasp this vision. But the problem is we are running too fast. We are constantly looking at our phones. We do not have time to actually do our due diligence and examine the evidence that's before us. Our life is falling apart. And we are forfeiting the abundant life. And we'll sit even at a Sunday service and be distracted. We have no time to allow the evidence, the message, the power of this message to liberate us. But it's not that easy. You can't just will yourself into repentance can't just will yourself into obedience. The Bible says that our hearts, our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? But friends, not only is our heart a rebellious heart, it is a, it, our heart is hostile towards God. Not only do we not believe in God, but we are hostile towards Him. Our hearts are so hard, they're so callous. You could sit in this sermon and you're just brushing off everything that was preached. Not even thinking about repentance. You're going to move on with your day. You're going to run your life however you're going to want to run your life. God's word is not authoritative to you. And so, friends, we desperately need the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our hearts for us to see this vision. We need the Holy Spirit to open up the, eye, the ears of our hearts to hear this message. We need it. And so what I want to ask you today to do is ask the Holy Spirit to cause you to will and to do. God, I see it, but I don't feel it. God, help me, please. Help my will make this decision, God, please. Holy Spirit, Give me the supernatural gift of repentance. Grant me repentance, God, do it. I will not leave until you grant me repentance, until I've made a decision to follow you for the rest of my life, God, not for a season, but for the rest of, finally becoming a disciple, not a cultural Christian, not a weekend warrior, but a disciple of Jesus Christ that is practicing the way of Jesus in our ordinary lives. So if you guys want to stand on your feet, we're going to plead for grace and mercy. Father, would you give us the gift of repentance? Friends, if you want to stretch out your hands this afternoon, 
Lord, would you give us the gift of repentance? Would we, would our hearts be moved today to turn back to you and to surrender all ownership back to you? Understanding that only when we do that, we will be able to be healthy souls that produce genuine love towards God and genuine love towards people. God, do it for us. Spirit, quicken our hearts. God, please soften the hearts, Lord. Holy Spirit, soften the hearts. Let them see the ruin that they're in or even potential ruin. God, let them see the beauty of the kingdom, of the rule and reign of God. Let them see this abundant life that you are offering to your disciples. Let them see the love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, God, that you are offering. That could be theirs in all circumstances. Friends, I want to invite you to uh, come and receive your elements. Today is communion, and this is a heart posture. As we come and we take up these elements and we acknowledge that without Christ, we are nothing and we can do nothing. And he not only saves us, but he sustains us. Amen? If you guys want to come and, and, and take them, start from your right, and then uh, you guys can make a full circle back to your seats. We're going to, I'm going to, we're going to be uh, coming back to our seats as you're coming. Just consider, reflect where you're at, and then we'll partake, and then we'll close with the song. Father, we will, I will serve you. And I thank you for causing me to will and to do. Today, I, I just recommit myself to your covenant. I recommit myself to your lordship. And I acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, that he is my great teacher, my rabbi, my king. 
And I will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from his mouth. And I will not boast in myself. I will not boast in my obedience. I will boast in the blood of Jesus Christ that has cleansed me, that has provided a way for me to long for you, Father. that enables me to remain as a son and an heir that cries out, Abba, Father. To you be the glory, Jesus. To you be the honor, Jesus. You alone are good. You alone are worthy. We love you today with my brothers and sisters. As your disciples, we look to you and we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being obedient to the Father and living the life that we are all now called to live. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Friends, you can partake in the elements, and uh, as you partake, we will start singing a song, and uh, I want to just encourage you. In I'm speaking right now to the heart. Tell your mind, tell your body, and maybe even tell your neighbor to worship the Lord. Amen.
with someone that is more glorious than you. It just feels so good to know that he is better than us. Here's what I want to do. I want to just encourage you. If you are trying to run a legit company, you got to stop spending time with people that are running shady companies. You will never learn how to run a company according to the, 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 the rules if you are only spending time with people that are cutting corners what discipleship is. It's what the church is. Find people in the church that have yielded their hearts to the Lord and that are, are governing the rest of their members according to God's will, not theirs. And then learn from these people and allow these people to call you out and encourage and correct you and rebuke you if needed. It's the only way we can do this why Jesus said, go and make disciples, teaching them to observe, go and model to them and instruct them. Join a life group. Our men's groups are past capacity, but we will have another semester for men's groups. And it is, it is profound. Our, our uh, renovation of the heart is just awesome. I love it. Ladies are launching up in two weeks. You guys are coming up here soon. Ladies, we only have nine of you signed up. We need we don't need to. You need to sign up. <laughs> We're good. Uh, you need to sign up if you're not signed up in a ladies group yet. God bless you guys. Enjoy this beautiful, uh, I think it's still summer day. 